Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Christine Martin Anderson, Senior Vice President and Civilian Services Lead at Booz Allen Hamilton. Well, hello, good afternoon. Thank you for joining us for our Innovating the Government Experience panel. I'm really excited to bring this panel to you. Uh, we have two great panelists that are in the middle of government transformation and the digital experience for our citizens. And I'm going to give you a ch them a chance to introduce themselves and tell their story in just a moment. But just sort of frame the panel. I think it's no, exper no, it's no secret that the government lags behind the private sector when it comes to government experience scores, or any customer experience scores. And this has been true for a long time. And I don't have to ask you, because I know that you've all experienced digital services like Amazon, Uber, Netflix. And you're used to a certain type of experience, on demand, available when you want it at all times, efficient, effective. And we have now the same expectation of our government digital experience. So I want to ask you, by a show of hands, if, how many of you have used a government website or app that you would say is on par with the best consumer apps? OK. And, we <laughs> and some of our Booz Allen team, thank you. Um, we, I want to come back when we, when we do some of the Q&A and if you have a story to tell to share that. Um, I want to share my personal story just because it um, helps you explain why we have these two gentlemen on the stage. And this is not an, uh, an app that Booz Allen actually helped to develop to my knowledge, but it's a personal experience I've had with a government um, digital um, application. So how many of you have actually heard of Mobile Passport? Anyone? A few of you, right? I actually think that's awesome as in, the, in terms of the efficiency, the on-demand. So basically what it does is you land, when you land back in the United States from an international trip, you can, while you're still on the airplane after they give you the clue that you're allowed to use your personal devices, you go ahead and say where you are, where you're coming from. You can fill out that what would, what would have been a little piece of paper for your declarations right there on your app. You check off which of your family members are with you. And then that information goes to the Customs and Border Protection. And then when you get off the plane and you move through the shuttle lines, you go to an ex expedited area, right? And that information is pulled up. It tells you before you get in line if your passports are valid, if all your materials are in order. And then w when you get up to the agent, that agent no longer does the administrative work and you're processed much quicker. When I first experienced it about a year ago, I didn't want to tell anybody because I thought, what happens? <laughs> it's like the pre-check line, right? Somehow it gets longer than the regular <laughs> line. Um, but then I really started thinking about this experience when moving from the, at the time when you used to just everyone got in line and waited for the agent to the time when we had, which we still have in most airports um, and kiosks, right? Uh, at least at Dulles, you know, you can go into the kiosk and you do the same information to the mobile experience. And that doesn't just happen. Um, I did some research on how this mobile passport uh, came to be, and it's all public sources, so if anyone knows a private story, you can, you can tell me later. But two TSA executives started a company um, to create mobile passport. And in partnership with Customs and Border Protection, they produced this app, and they are actually a startup that has a Class A series investment. So, um, uh, a different kind of purchase for the government. So if you imagine what it takes to get that done. So we have a CIO with us, right? You have to have the vision and, uh, of what the journey looks like for knowing what your customer needs and taking them through the journey. Also, it's more efficient because they're, they're using less labor. People are waiting in line longer. And then you also need some really fancy procurement work. And so we have a procurement officer here. Because you have to know who to buy from. You have to have a process that allows the startup to come bring their idea forward and have a way to make it a reality. Now, it's a private company still, and it's the only authorized mobile app for Customs and Border Protection. But you can imagine a day when um, there could be multiple competing apps, assuming they could all be secure um, and, uh, and all work as effectively. Or they may corner the market, right? I, I found it to be a great experience. So this is the IT modernization, 
The customer digital experience is a huge priority for the federal government. It is part of the 2018 President's Management Agenda, specifically asking departments and agencies to improve the digital experience of citizens. And we have two folks here who are going to tell you the story about where they are and how they've gotten where they are. And then we're going to open it up for some questions from you. So, Gandeep. So thank you so much uh, for the introduction and thanks for inviting me to come here and talk a little bit about uh, what IT modernization uh, we are doing in the government. Uh, I think there is a lot of focus in the president's management agenda on uh, IT modernization. Uh, first, I wanted to start with what the Department of Labor actually does for citizens. I think uh, most of us know, oh, they are the numbers guys. Uh, I get the unemployment figures from you. Um, there is a lot more that we do for uh, uh, the citizens. So I wanted to talk a little bit about what we do. Uh, we have uh, an Office of Workman Compensation claims that basically if any worker in America gets hurt, we process their claims. We make sure that they, are, they get their claim in a timely fashion and they are paid during that time of injury. Another well-known part of ours is um, OSHA, is the Occupational Safety and Health Administration. And we also have an organization that keeps our minds safe, right? So we go out to every small business, large business across the nation, make sure uh, that all, all, all the standards to protect the workers are being followed. OSHA actually flies drones to inspect oil rigs and get into those locations which, uh, which are hard to access safely. And we actually make sure uh, that people who are working on oil rigs are safe too. Our Employment Training Administration actually is creating a lot of training opportunities. Um, very recently, we launched the apprenticeship.gov uh, website that is supposed to be all things apprenticeship in one place, right? So I'm hoping next time Christine asks that question, which website, government website you like, you would actually go to apprenticeship.gov and experience it. It's very modern and sort of uh, uh, mimics if you are an apprenticeship finder how to get there. Uh, unemployment insurance. Nobody thinks about Department of Labor when you think about you, uh, unemployment insurance. Every state network is administered and underwritten by uh, Employment Training Administration at the Department of Labor. Not many people think about us when they are thinking about temporary work visas. Every temporary work visa actually is processed through the, it begins at the Department of Labor, right? So if, if you hear stories about crab pickers in Maryland not being available, well, something went wrong. Um, and I hate to say this, but we are a part of that process as well. So there are a lot of uh, uh, different things that the Department of Labor does. It makes my life more difficult because I don't have a one mission area that I have to support as a CIO. I have to make sure that we put in the IT tools that not only help you cl process claims faster, but also make sure that unemployment checks go out in a timely fashion. We are flying drones to make sure oil rigs are safe. We have to make sure mines are safe as well. We have to find apprenticeships. We have to get those crab pickers at the right place at the right time as well. So that is to give you a little bit about what Department of Labor does. Uh, the temp visa program is uh, particularly close to me. I'm a generation zero immigrant who actually came through that program uh, in the year 2000, uh, landed at Dulles Airport, uh, put myself through school. It's, it's, uh, I have a little bit of passion on that program as well. Uh, I will turn it over to Harrison to talk a little bit about IRS, which everybody knows, by the way, what they do. Internal Revenue Service, everybody yeah. got that one? Um, no, I, I think that, thanks so much, and Christine and, and Booz Allen Hamilton for, for having us here as well. I think it becomes really interesting when you talk about the importance of how the benefits of the mobile passport app go towards the user, but also are a demonstration of what the government is trying to do with its industry partners. 
to improve the customer experience, but to drive down its own costs. So I'm going to look down for a second and, and read uh, a fairly well-known, should be well-known, uh, three set of goals uh, for folks, see if they know where it's from. Personalizing, and these are organizational goals, right? Okay. Personalizing digital interactions with customers. Personalizing, make them very personal. Being clear and transparent about the current status of orders and what the next steps are that come up in the process. And lastly, provide more timely information and promote earlier resolutions of transactions in the process. Anybody know? Amazon. The IRS Office of Online Services. <laughs> but thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. You proved my point. Um, one of the other things I noticed as we came in is at least one or two people had their phone out. That's how we live. That's how I live. I used Uber to get here. I pulled out my phone to do that. At the IRS, we start to take a look at, at the manner in which the taxpayer engages with us. As opposed to simply stating, this is how we're going to do things, and the taxpayer is needing to respond, we ask the question, how is the taxpayer engaging with us? And it's somewhere around 48% of the times that IRS.gov is accessed, it's from a phone. So we took a step back, said, how do we make sure that we're driving the analytics, identifying areas that the customer, the taxpayer, is really working towards? There's actually an app, a process, an application, excuse me, on iris.gov that answers a very frequent question. And it's named very appropriately, where's my refund? There's actually an IRS mobile app, irs to go which you can utilize to check the status of your refund 24 hours after you submit it electronically. These are the kinds of things now we all have, I think we all, excuse me, have places to improve, and the IRS is certainly no exception to that. But the fact that we're looking and asking questions to the customer about what we need to do to improve their experience so that they can satisfy their tax liabilities in the most efficient path forward for everybody, the taxpayer as well as us, um, that's really important. From a procurement standpoint, you really hit the nail on the head. Um, my original uh, foray into the foreign, uh, excuse me, into the federal government came from when I worked on aircraft carriers as a procurement officer uh, at the Naval Sea Systems Command. Really big items, right? This is a city floating on its side that also happens to be a nuclear power plant. There's a completely different set of interactions and set of companies who support that type of thing. Then there's, we're getting into DX, we're getting into CX, UX, analytics, these types of things. And if the federal government, if the procurement guy, right, if we can't buy in an efficient fashion for our customers, right, and we have four customers, and I'll get to that in one second, but if we can't buy to support our customers and the requirements owner in a, in a way that enables those types of companies to do business with us, we are failing. You are increasing the cost to do business with the federal government, and all you do is make the services and the solutions that you purchase more expensive. All you do is have a startup firm who's never done business with the federal government go, I don't really want to deal with all that noise. That solicitation, that request for a bid is 150 pages. I can't be bothered to read that, much less respond to it. I don't have the time, I don't have the interest, and you're not going to tell me for X amount of time. Now, you mentioned the series of fundings. Um, when you've got companies who are really on the cutting edge of saying fraud detection algorithms, RPAs, they're looking for money at the very beginning. They can't wait that long. And if we in the government, if we in the Internal Revenue Service are not asking those questions of our customers, which are, one, the people who own the requirement, how do I get a drone out there? How am I going to buy those services? Two, our team, the procurement team, because it's a fairly specific skill in a city where there's a lot of demand uh, to buy the government's services and solutions. Then you've got the actual industry that provides it. Again, if we don't make our processes simpler so that different types of companies can come in, we're going to get the same answer, might get the same answers from the same type of firms for the same prices. We can't afford to function that way. And then you've got the American taxpayer. That's our customer. Some people, a lot of the people in the federal government can say that, DOL can say that. We have a rather personal relationship with our customer on an ongoing basis. Um, that's what we use to drive our conversations within the IRS Office of Procurement about who is your customer. 
Are you asking the right questions? Are you listening? Because if you continue to function in the same fashion and support these emerging needs within the federal government, we've got really big problems. We've got really cool problems. Right? You want to work for major Fortune 100 company, major Fortune 50 company, Fortune 1 companies exist too. We can drive innovation, we continue to drive innovation if we can do it in the right way, if we can promote the right conversations with the right people at the right time. Procurement, from my standpoint, is not always known to be a quick item. I mentioned a 150-page solicitation and ask for a bid. Those exist. We're working on solicitations that are six pages long. You can read it quickly. You can find out, say, you know what? This looks good to me. How do we test things more quickly? Right? How do we test something within the environment? Make sure you give it to the user, ask their opinion, and have that be part of the determination on which solution to select. Not that novel a concept, but it's not something that we always take the advantage of how to do it within the federal government. If we don't promote those processes, if procurement doesn't promote those processes for all of our customers, we are not doing our job. Last quick point. A couple years ago, the Office of Procurement had 500 people in it. We now have less than 300. I'm not saying the right number is 500. I'm not saying the right number is 300. But you cannot continue to process things in the same fashion and expect a better result when you have 40% fewer resources. It is just not commonsensical at all. Let's try to find a way to take acceptable risks at the right time that have a chance to really promote the customer experience, to drive down costs for us, and ultimately our customer, the American taxpayer. Thank you. So Booz Allen did a survey together with Ipsos uh, to look at expectations of the government around digital experience and found that the expectations are at an all-time high. 78% um, of respondents expected to be able to access the government online. Um, as you mentioned, everyone has a phone. I think that's true if your age is in the single digits to if your age is in the triple digits. And so mobile will be added in there, too. How is that changing the way you do business? Uh, so <laughs> our end users are as impatient as ever, right? I, I mean, I, if I, can't, I go to a, a website and I can't find something in two clicks or three clicks, I'm not going back, right? I mean, that's the audience that we have to cater to. And they have very similar expectations uh, from government websites as well. Um, and it's, we're trying to instill that, that regimen, that UX mentality, right, uh, when we are building new websites, when we are putting out new services. Um, I think the, the example that I was talking about, uh, apprenticeship.gov, um, so we didn't put out this website uh, without talking to each other. We talk about user requirements. Uh, we run 130 job core centers uh, around uh, the country. So what did we do? We went and talked to these uh, folks who are going in through the job cores uh, centers and say, hey, if you are going to look for an apprenticeship, how would you go look for it, right? And that's the reason, and, and apprenticeship.gov is not the government website that does not work on this version of Chrome or it will not render properly on Android, or, I mean, that's the kind of uh, recipe for disaster. Uh, very little uh, uh, chance to, to, for that kind of an error at this point in time. So we've, we've actually in instituted that mentality, every solution that we are putting out there. And I will say, it's not only the external customer. It is the internal customer as well, because we are all doing business very differently in our private lives. Just because I'm a federal employee doesn't mean I will take subpar service or I have to take 50 clicks to just to get to something, right? So, so it is that mentality that has to be uh, put in every single time we put out a product. And I, I talked about different mission areas. Um, it, it's a tough job for us to, to, but what we are trying to do is build a platform that is scalable and that these mobile capabilities, uh, the rendering in any browser, uh, the UX mentality come out of the box. I think I'm, I'm very proud to say that one of the uh, programs that we've run uh, for a long time, for about 12 years now, is the benefits.gov. It was one of the original uh, programs where uh, under the e-government uh, initiative, 
we tried to bring, hey, if I am a private citizen, I don't want to go to 50 different agencies to find where my benefit is coming from, whether it's local, state. So I'm proud to say that that website has thrived um, for the last 12 years. Um, it's completely mobile. There are, it, there are 16 different federal agencies that actually contribute into it, right? And we put out about 1,400 different benefits, right? And that's an, an element of success. Go to benefits.gov and see it if you've not seen a government website that works for people. Um, it's got all of the sophistication around where do I access it from. If I access it from Virginia, vis-a-vis -vis DC, I get a different result set, right? Um, and these are some things that we have taken for granted with Amazon, right? So if I buy an iPhone, I al almost expect the bottom of the screen do you, to say, do you want a case? Do you want an extra charger? Um, and that's the kind of thing benefits.gov will do for you. If you go on there and say, hey, I'm out of a job, or I'm looking for food subsidies, or I'm looking for a housing, or I'm looking for an SBA loan, not only will it serve you the right answer, it will also suggest other things, uh, just like Amazon does. Uh, so I think it's a, it's a mindset, uh, and it, it's a cultural change for the government as well. It, it doesn't come easy. Uh, but I'm proud to say that our, our team has a sort of uh, practiced it, and we are trying to move the ball forward. Um, the big problem is fragmentation, right? I mean, where do I go uh, to get a benefit? Or we were talking about recreation.gov. Uh, and I think that's where the government should probably come together in different departments. Just like 16 departments have come in to benefits.gov, uh, I'm, not, I'm not saying we should have one mega website for everything, which is government.gov. I, I don't think that works. <laughs> uh, but at the same time, you don't want, if you're looking for a benefit, uh, you don't want to go for, to 50 different places. If you're looking for, to reserve a site in um, the Shenandoah National Park, I don't want to figure out, oh, Shenandoah has its own, Yosemite has its own website, right? And that mindset, I think, uh, along with building a, a technology platform that is scalable and that renders on every mobile technology, that renders, um, I mean, we had this uh, Florence uh, with a storm recently. We got about 1.2 million hits through benefits.gov and 70% of that traffic came from mobile devices and there was a diversity uh, People were able to get to disasterassistance.gov. They could get their claims. They could get people uh, to their, their uh, home uh, and uh, in times of need. And those are the times when you don't need to be thinking about, OK, now where do I go? I, I need government assistance. Right. But I I've lost my home. I'm on the road. I don't know where my next meal is coming from. Let me Google where to get, the, get assistance from, right? Siri. Right? Yeah. <laughs> Um, so, I, I think that, that really what you're talking about is, is the expansion of what a customer expects, right? You still have um, an individual who wants to touch a piece of paper, right, when they file their tax return manually. Uh, you still have the person who wants to um, engage with an actual person or sit down at an actual tax assistance center, which for the record I didn't know that we had until I started working for the IRS. Um, you, want, you have the people. Uh, and there's about eight and a half million of them so far who have, I want to do it on my phone. Iris, you know, Iris to go has eight and a half million users currently. Um, you have folks who want to actually write a check and send it in. Um, quick tangent, I saw a, a meme, for lack of a better term, on, on LinkedIn, and it says, I can't use a fax machine because of where I live. Where do you live? In the 21st century. <laughs> so. Not knocking anybody who likes a fax machine, but the reality is there's a broad spectrum of the customer. And you have to be prepared to move quickly enough to adjust to what they want, who they want to engage with, and how they're going to proceed. One of the things that the IRS was able to roll out because they're focusing on this type of flexibility um, is, is online account, which will actually let you pay with a credit or a debit card. It'll let you pay by signing up for a payment plan. These are the types of things that, that IRS is looking to, to engage in and to improve upon. 
Um, and I think the point is you've got an evolving expectation, right? Before was I expect my phone to be only this big with, you know, the Zach more special, sorry, that dates me a little bit, the Zach more special, you know, phone, and then it got really small like the Zoolander since we're continuing the pop culture references that's this big, and now, of course, we want the tablet that fits on the side of my head, right? So it moves. So you've got to be able to move at the same time. Um, and that's one of the areas where, you know, we've referenced Amazon quite a bit. They roll out updates every day, if memory serves thousands of them. Now, we're not there, but we roll out updates to online account on average about every nine weeks. And so it gets you a service to the customer that is, com is continuing to expand, is to continuing to be enriched. We have chat sessions now. And it's very interesting because, again, the customer we've said for so long, the IRS is not going to call you and tell you that they owe you money. There are a lot of phone calls I, out there. I, I, uh, my friend got one and said, hey, the IRS headquarters is on 12th and Constitution. They said, you know, great. I'm glad that you told me that I owe you money. I can meet you at 12th and Constitution, and I can have my buddy who works with criminal investigation meet us there, too. They hung up very quickly after that conversation. But it's important to understand that you need to be able to shift and to address to the different customer experience requirements that you've got while still making it easier for everybody to get to where they want to go. So Harrison, you're touching on speed, right? The speed of innovation. Mm -hmm. um, as we know, it just keeps getting faster. Uh, we're here in an innovation zone, right? It's, it's what we're all uh, aspiring to is speed. Uh, but I remember 13 years ago when I first started working for Booz Allen in the government sector, one of my customers said to me, you know, the government's not built for speed. And you should be glad for that. This is what the customer told me. Uh, because when we do great things, we impact lots of people. And when we make mistakes, we impact lots of people. So we're meant to be a little bit slower um, by nature. Now, that's a challenge in this innovation environment. And I know that in your role, you have to uh, know what's out there, right? Here's what's the art of the possible. And so I've heard about your reverse industry days you've been doing as a way to hear what's the art of the possible. Could you talk a little bit about that? Sure. So for those of you who aren't familiar with the sort of government contractor industry uh, symbiosis, I'll call it, um, quite often what happens is that we, the government, will say, this is what we want, this is how you're going to build it, and now give it to me cheap and give it to me fast. Um, when you're looking for innovation and you put out that many guardrails, you're not going to get it. My personal opinion, there's two reasons for that. One, you're not asking any questions. And two, you're assuming you're the smartest person, which is not always the case. Sometimes it is, sometimes it isn't. So what normally we would do in an industry day is we would stand up and talk to potential industry partners, potential people who want us to pay them to give us laptops, to give us services, to give us uh, dev apps, whatever it is. We turned it on its end and we put the industry representatives up here on the stage and said, what drives your costs? What do you wish we did differently? How do we get innovation? And to their credit, they were blunt and they were honest and they were professional. They said, I don't think you realize how much money we spend because we're not clear on what your requirement actually is, on what you actually want us to do. You gave us 150 pages, and I still don't understand what your goal is. We kind of nod, and we kind of nod. We price that into the cost of our contracts and our proposals. And because I'm me, how much? Well, last contract we bid on, we priced in $5 million. $5 million over five years. How much was the total proposal for? $50 million. So you've got a 10% premium because you haven't gone out and done your homework as the federal government and said, what do I need to understand about how you function? And that works with, again, one of the customers is industry. Same thing works for the customers being the taxpayer. If you don't ask the question, if you don't give enough of an open aperture for folks to come in and say, hey, you're trying to do it this way with the Volkswagen, I've got a kick-ass, sorry, carrot that will do it even better, cheaper, and faster. We don't want to be the people who say, you know, some things you need to be specific about, right? Some things need to be very measured. But if you say, my goal is 
to help the American taxpayers satisfy their tax liabilities in an efficient fashion and understand what their rights are, there's a lot of room to move in there. If you say, I want you to go one, two, three, four, hop on one foot and spin around and sit down, you're going to get the same thing from every single person. You can call it groupthink. You can call it anything you want, but that's a bad recipe when you're looking for innovation and you don't fully understand the repercussions of your actions. Thank you. Now, I know that we have microphones if those, anyone out there has a question. So I want to invite you, if you are interested, to raise your hand. Um, and in the meanwhile, maybe while you're thinking of some questions, I... Very intelligent question. Yes. <laughs> intelligent question. There we go. Kick, kick ass. Walk yes, sorry. Yes. Two S's. Two S's. Hi, I um, actually work for NASA, and we've been having a lot of discussions similar to what you just said about asking the questions, but we're not, of course, we don't have customers, right? So in this sense, it's asking the questions internally, what do our day-to-day -day workers want? And I just want to hear your thoughts about that. So respectfully, I'm, I'm, I'm going to argue against the point that you just make, respectfully again. I would say that you do have customers, you just need to identify who they are. Right, everyone likes to tell the story, and it's a very accurate and very poignant story about what's NASA's mission? To put an individual on the moon, right? Your customer is that individual, right? And that's, that's probably not, I probably didn't have that completely right. But I think you've got the point, if you're in your procurement, you've got customers. You've got your team, you've got the person who holds the money. Um, you've got the individual that, frankly, you're trying to, to put in some individual space. You've got those customer-centric conversations. And it doesn't necessarily have to fit directly into the CX experience. But if you take yourself out of the engagement, which is, I know what I need to do, and I know how I'm going to get there, and now I just need to have other people help me do it. It really starts to change the conversation. You get folks in, in the room who see things from a completely different point of view. You know, a quick example is, if you're writing, creating a new contract writing system, Ask the people who write the contracts. They're your customers. It may be your contract writing system, but I think it's really important to note that who the end user is going to be will determine how efficient that process will be. And if you're not asking, to me, the experts are the people who are using the system and are experiencing that engagement, whatever it is. Um, and so again, I'm being intentionally sort of com not combative, but I hope you get the point that I'm trying to make, which is if you turn the lens around and say, what is my end goal? Not I know what it is. Uh, it's an interesting, an interesting point of view to look at things. It doesn't always work, but it often Thank helps. And I, and I do agree. I mean, you still have a customer. It's, it's an internal person that would allow you to define, okay, this is where we want to go, right? This is what we want to build. Um, and I will tell you, uh, in the government, I, I actually um, uh, have used procurement vehicles where you have half a page, you tell the industry what, to, what your objectives are, not what to do, but yes. what the objectives are, uh, because I, I have seen this several times. We don't even ask the right questions sometimes, right? And then it, it kills the innovation. So if you put out those, and those vehicles are available, right? Uh, HHS has them, a whole bunch, where you can let people compete yep. on, and innovate, and it may or may not result in a contract or some work at the end, but it at least allows you to let, uh, allows the people to think about it, all the smart people, um, and that's how you do it. Uh, I mean, that's the only way, yeah. Thank you. Hi, I, I'm, I'm actually an end user. So uh, I would just request, uh, aside from functionality, which obviously is very important, that there's also a big emphasis on um, two-step authentication for login, just because I think nowadays, uh, you know, obviously hacking and uh, security is also a big issue. So that whatever you roll out, especially if it's going to connect to the government, that it has those extra layers. That's a very pertinent and accurate point. Yes. Okay. Uh, yeah, I, and I think cybersecurity is at the top of everybody's yeah. mind these days. Uh, identity. I think the government has put out uh, 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 solutions around it. Login.gov is is one of them, and we are trying to leverage all of these capabilities. Uh, it gets tough, though, right? Um, what if you don't have a phone? If you're not living in the current century, right? Then how do you do two-factor authentication with that person, right? Um, I've, 
I've actually have an account with SSA.gov, and they, you can use email if you yeah. have a phone. Yeah. So yes. yes, absolutely. I think that has to be baked into every solution that goes out, and that's what I, the platform mentality that I was talking about, right? It's not you don't build it. Oh, this thing has an integration to accept payments. Uh, this one has because if you outline your your requirements in a narrow way, you will never get a platform that works for, for example, labor has all these diverse use cases from claims to apprenticeships to training to put, putting out the job list numbers. They're all very diverse. But all of them interact with the customers, right? So all of them have reporting needs. All of them have login, two-factor authentication, and those. So I think we, we can do that. And be well. And I think, if I may, the other balance, right, is that you want to promote the usability of the site, and you don't want to make it over, overly cumbersome, but you also want to make sure that you, you, you're talking to the right person about the right thing at the right time. So it, it is very much a balance. And the only thing I would bring is back to sort of understanding what the objective is and, under, and understanding the exact process that you want to go through. Sometimes it has to be that way. You have to say red, yellow, green, that's what we're going to do. But other times you want to say, I need to be able to ensure that this person is this person. And when you start saying things like that, you, can, you open the aperture, you open the competitive marketplace to biometrics. Right? There's actually technology and applications that say on your phone, you tend to do this with your left hand and you type in this fashion. And this is where you tend to be. Right? So when you open up the aperture, you really start saying, OK, I don't have to do it this way. Um, and I think that's really, really important. And when you combine that with the user stories, right? what are we trying to get to? What's the end goal? What are your pain points? And that coupled with the, I don't always have to know the exact right answer. I'm willing to talk to the experts. And I'm willing to ask questions. The combination of those two things is an incredibly, incredibly powerful thing. Absolutely. Security, very, very important. Hi, um, my name is Mina. I am going into the management consulting space in government. Um, so I'm really excited to hear that you guys are all about innovation. What I'd be curious to hear is, I doubt you're the majority. Um, how do you go about convincing your um, coworkers who maybe aren't bought in yet that this really does have value? So I, that's a great question. That's a great question. And I'm going to quote uh, a good friend of mine who used to be the CIO at both Justice and Department of Homeland Security. Uh, if you haven't tried the waters with government service, hop on in. I think you'll like it. Um, the reality is, is that there are some, the nature of some, frankly, government work is very specific. What the Office of Federal Procurement Policy and the Office of Management and Budget, which drive a lot of these approaches across the government, what they've said is that you need to have an acquisition innovation advocate. You need to have an industry liaison who asks these questions. You need to have a CTO in some cases that's function, that focuses on these types of things. Um, you could look at, uh, look at Austin, Texas, right? Army Futures Command, which is how do we do things in the future? They're asking these types of questions and really engaging. So there are certainly some areas which are focused on, I need to get through one through three in order to satisfy this need. And there are other portions which are focusing on, how do I change that from a one to a three conversation to a, I need to get here. So if you're really, to be specific, look for acquisition innovation advocates, look for procurement innovation labs, look for CTOs, look for um, other transaction authorities. Those are the types of things where you'll start to find a lot of really smart and really intelligent people, sometimes literally the smartest people on the planet on those things are working to push the envelope to address what the user needs, to solve the national security needs of the nation. Um, and you really don't get a better mission than that. And as an organization that works across government, I can tell you that uh, the demand for improving the experience is the same across government, meaning the demand is there. The demand for security is the same across government. Um, you're right in that different programs will move at different paces according to the missions um, and the imperative to go at different speeds. But I think this is also where we use our voice, right? If you have a specific place in government that you need to see innovation for you as a citizen, I think there's, there are many ways to jump into that and either join <laughs> or, or make it known. Yeah. And, I, and I do think there are a lot of, lot of innovative people in the government already, right? So, and it's growing. Yeah. And I, I'm telling you, nothing feeds uh, better than success, right? So every time you succeed with one of these initiatives, 
right? The other thing that you have to really look at is what mission area is, is, is your passion, right? We look at these employee viewpoint surveys coming out of NASA. Oh my God, like 90% of them are so passionate about uh, putting people into space or do the mission of NASA, right? What is pa that passion for you, right? Go in for that. And, I, and I'm telling you, I find those passionate people every single day in every mission area, right? Um, and it's, the tide is turning slowly, but it is. I can give you just a 15 second example. So robotic process automation, right? Chatbots. You wouldn't normally think of government buying process as a way to do that. We awarded a contract last fiscal year to insert robotic process automation into the procurement process so that we can shift, and this is the other part of the conversation, there's a real push uh, within the leadership uh, all the way up and down the chain to move from low value work to high value work. So if I can go in and say, I'm gonna type in the same number in the same website six or seven or eight or nine or 10 times because I need to get that information. And then I'm gonna bring it back and I'm gonna put it in a, in a report, I'm gonna type it up, I'm gonna sign it. That's gonna take me three to four hours. In the right scenario, a bot can do that in two minutes. And it can do it at night when you're at home sleeping. So there's lots of different places and lots of different customers and lots of different ways uh, to get into that innovative spirit. And I think it's a really exciting time to be in government or to be supporting government. So one thing I want to know uh, before we wrap up is uh, what are those sites on the government that you think are as effective as private sector? I think there was at least someone over here who had a, a hand up. You like your hand up right? so move the microphone over here. I don't think it would. I'm going to call on you. You're going to tell us? So Thank you. We, we're just really excited about rec.gov that was announced okay. this week on October 1st. Everybody check it out. Um, it's a new way to reserve spots in the Shenandoah Valley or wherever you want to go. Thank you. And others? So, no, that's, that's good. Thank you. And just a final question. Yes, ma'am. So, What's coming next, right? What can citizens expect from their government in the next three years? I'm going to keep it close because, you know, innovation is fast. So what will the experience be like then that's better than it is now? So how about I'll start real quick. So I think what you'll start to see uh, is an emphasis on making data-driven decisions, um, continuing emphasis on that. There's actually a bipartisan committee on evidence-based policy making, and that's exactly what it sounds like. Let's take evidence, let's identify what things are actually successful and actually work the investment, and if they're not, we need to adjust. And that's really what you start to get to, as opposed to having, for instance, a five-year contract that does the same thing for five years, let's start off with a five-month contract or a five-day contract and say, Tell me what you can do for a microservice for $10,000. If it seems to whet the appetite, if it seems to work, then let's make the next progression. So I think it's going to be these, and I'm really interested in what you're going to say, sir, but I think it's these incremental improvements, um, the sort of DevOps approach, the agile approach to everything, to how we buy, to how do we deploy for the customer services, to how we engage with all of our customers. That, I think, will be the fundamental change uh, that, that we'll see in the next two to three years. Since you're talking DevOps, I should talk procurement. I love it. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I had to look that up before I got here. Yes. Um, no, I think, uh, I think there is a lot of innovation. I, I'm, I'm not going to talk about artificial intelligence, about bots, about Blockchain. innovation in cybersecurity, and all of these things, I think, are coming, right? Um, I, I do think at labor, what, what we want to do is uh, implement, for example, I mean, about uh, information uh, decision making, right? <laughs> uh, database decision making. We dispatch a inspector to every mine, active mine in the country, regardless of what their mining record is, right? We dispatch an OSHA inspector to every small business every year, right? Why do we need to do that, right? right. We have seen, we have the inspection history for all of these locations for 10 years, 15 years. Basic things like risk based. Uh, inspection regimen, right? Uh, training. We have a, a mine in Beckley, West Virginia, where every miner has to go underground and train themselves, right? The other day, I, I had this hollow lens where we, have, we are trying to map the entire mine. So rather than making every mining inspector travel 
from different parts of the country and training them in Beckley, I'm going to send them in HoloLens. You can do your certification and get trained over there, right? I want uh, to, uh, there are people who are uh, putting in workman compensation claims to our one part of, and then uh, unemployment insurance claims to the state, okay? It's called double dipping, right? You're not allowed to do that. We are unable, because, because of fragmentation, we are unable to sort of bring all of these things together. Uh, there is innovation in, in, in hiring that we need to implement, getting talent, right? So I think uh, the technological advancements are there, right? I think we have to change our mindset a little bit in the government. And what's coming next is each one of these mission areas. We want success measures. Did I make the claims faster? Did I actually reduce the burden on, on mines? Did I actually uh, improve up the number of op apprenticeship opportunities out there? Uh, that's the measure for success for Department of Labor, and I think that's what is coming next. Thank you. So I'll put a challenge out there. If anyone in the next year to three years uh, uses a government website that they find as good as the best consumer sites, then I want you to send me directly an email. Yeah. <laughs> wanna, we're, gonna, we're gonna check it out. We're gonna have to find a way to log it. So thank you all for coming. Um, it is happy hour, so please stay and enjoy some refreshments and snacks, and we're really grateful to have you today. And thank you to our panelists. Thank you.